Xin chào. Welcome back everyone to our Build It Certified Facilitator and Master Teacher Training. I'm Dr. Kathy Weigel and we have Dr. Scott Danielson back with us again from the ASU Polytechnic School at the Ira A. Fulton Schools of Engineering. So today Scott is going to share a little bit with us about new teaching methodologies and active learning. Great and um, hopefully it'll be an active session. <laughs> So, Scott, we hear a lot about um, new teaching methodologies, active learning, project, problem-based learning. What's, what's the difference between these terms? What do they mean and how is it different than what we're currently doing? Well, most of us um, were raised on what I would call traditional lecture, um, content delivery. Um, and so active learning basically tries to leave behind that passive what is a passive experience for the students. Students just sit there and listen, maybe take notes, mm -hmm. maybe manage to stay awake, um, to something that is much more active. And to me, active learning is the overall term. So it's the umbrella in which those other sorts of learning that you mentioned um, fit, whether it's project-based learning or problem-based learning. But there are many other techniques that fit within active learning besides just those two P-based learnings, problem or project-based learning. So basically the whole idea with active learning is it engages the students. It gets the students doing something. Okay. And that may be just having a conversation like we are about the topic in class as compared to just each person sitting in their private world. Um, or it may be a team, it may be some other mode of uh, engagement. But active equal engagement would be the way I would say it. Do you have some examples um, that you can share with us that would illustrate the difference between passive and, and active learning? Okay, for instance, um, I mentioned the sitting and taking note notes, um, listening to a faculty member present or reading their own book, those would be very passive. Um, but perhaps if I start to watch a movie or a video clip about something, um, now I'm a little more engaged because I have both the audio channel as well as the visual channel coming at me. It's there's action happening. But so that's a little more active, not I'm a still whole in lot my more. own little yeah. world when I watch yeah. a movie. Um, I could show a demonstration or use a demonstration. Um, I might even involve a student in that demonstration. Mm -hmm. Now that one student obviously would be very active, but just the fact that that student's involved or a group of students is involved, the rest of the students get more involved. Um, so we're we're kind of moving um, along the scale of um, towards more active learning. But for instance, um, if I have, um, if I ask a question and have the students turn to each other and discuss that question and talk about it, and then I ask different questions, different students to report what they and their partner talked about. Mm -hmm. Now they're much more actively engaged. Um, and again, I have that, that accountability because they don't know who I'm going to ask so they better have at least talked about something otherwise they'll be embarrassed. Or I can put them in a team and assign them a small what we've called mini project where they will work on some little thing right there in class. Um, or it could be a much larger project where they work for weeks together on a team accomplishing some sort of project. So those are, that's hopefully mm -hmm. a, a, a few ideas. Well, having students um, really engaged and interacting with each other, I mean, that sounds like great advice. Do you have some evidence to show it actually makes a difference or it's just more fun for them in the mm -hmm. class? Well, first I would say more fun probably equals, you know, happier students, uh, more engaged students, they'll be more satisfied. But yes, there are some very significant data that have been um, developed through some relatively rigorous research in learning that show that these active learning methods certainly make a dramatic, not just an impact, but a dramatic impact on learning. And so as we engage in these different forms of active learning, we see that the relevance to the students goes up. They see more reason to be studying what they're studying. And they also have much improved retention and performance on more traditional measures of academic learning, whether it be tests, concept inventories, any of those sorts of things. So how big can that difference really be? Well, it can be quite significant. Um, there was some work done by Richard Hake, um, and he looked at thousands of students in their learning. This was primarily in physics, so it was a STEM field. And he found that just if I looked, if he, he looked at what he called normalized gain um, and measured that, and so again, traditional lecture versus these active learning modes, 
And there was some significant increase in those, and there's some data um, available to show that, again, across many universities. So if you look at um, that normalized learning gain, it was about 0.23. So there was essentially a gain, but relatively small as measured by that 0.23. And we'll use that, just keep that in mind as okay. a placeholder. And when I went to the, when, well, when the instructor went to the active learning, that increased significantly to that 0.48. Mm -hmm. So essentially a doubling Double. in learning um, and retention by the students. So, and this was not problem or project based, it was just active based learning in a physics classroom. So a relatively dramatic increase. Well, that's impressive, but that structure, that structure is a big change. So it's going to take a while, take some time to develop something like that. Are there any shortcuts that our faculty in Vietnam can use? Well, I don't, <laughs> shortcut is an interesting term. I mean, in some ways, if, if Vietnamese or other people think about it, um, this style of learning goes back a long, long ways. Um, Confucius practiced it in his teaching. So it's certainly something that is, um, has been present in the culture. And so you do not need to do massive change, uh, particularly at the start. And so you can start small. Mm -hmm. In fact, that would be my advice is start small, practice something, see if it works, tweak it, make it better. Um, but to always be thinking about how you can do more active learning, more active engagement. So start small and build confidence. So Vietnam classes, and actually most of the lecture in Southeast Asia, similar to historically American classes. It, it hasn't traditionally been taught this way. As you mentioned, we're used to a very traditional lecture model. So how can we get the support of people in our institutions to make these changes, whether that's our dean, our academic leadership? How do we get that buy-in? Well, and again, I think that's one of the reasons this project is here uh, and this activity is to help faculty um, learn the tools and on also to help educate the administration um, to both encourage and create the space for the faculty to be able to do these things, to give them the freedom to do it. In some cases, no real support's needed. They just need the license to be able to do it. In other words, the ability to, to move forward, try something different. Faculty that at least I've talked to are, once they hear about these things and try them, they get excited and want to do them. So the administration can provide support, um, encourage faculty to participate in professional development to learn these things, and then recognize that maybe this changes the requirements of the course. Maybe they need some extra materials, some extra supplies mm -hmm. to do these things. And so the, certainly the administration has to be willing to provide that and recognize that there is value to them as well, to them the administration, thus the institution. If the f students are happier, that word spreads, industry is more pleased, they will support the institution. So there's, there's lots to be gained by doing these things. Um, also, you have to educate the students. Students That's sometimes true. resist this because they're used to just not being asked to do anything. Sit there in class, take the notes, worry about that big exam at the end to pass. So sometimes it, you have to kind of educate the students as to the value as well. But at least the, one, the, the Vietnamese faculty that I've talked to that have tried this, um, typically as a product of the HEAP training program, find that the students are very receptive. They want to do it. They enjoy it. Um, and so the faculty typically are very well regarded by the students for, for making these attempts. Right. And I have to say we've seen great feedback from the students even though as you say it takes them a little while to warm up but to a new mm -hmm. idea and, and quite thankfully the rectors, the leadership of all of our academic partners have been very very supportive uh, especially in nominating mm -hmm. and encouraging faculty to be part of this training and yep. part of this process. So I have an, another um, question. It's an, about another term that we mm -hmm. use a lot. We hear a lot about the value of what we talk about as collaborative learning, mm -hmm. uh, about working in teams, which I know we'll talk a little bit more about as we go through the various training. So how would you say the team learning complements the things we've already talked about, the project and problem-based types of learning? Well, typically team team-based activities in the classroom or outside the classroom where the students are engaged is very active learning um, because they're trying to accomplish a task, some sort of project or solving a problem. 
Um, but it also changes the nature of the learning as well in that usually a problem, and I'll just use the term problem-based learning, approached by a team, which means that now it's a collaborative team. They're all working together to try and solve this problem. And it tends to be a little bit of, okay, who's got the best skill in this area? If, if it's a sensor problem, well, who knows something about sensors? And so the other students learn from the one that may know something about sensors. And that makes that student feel good. He is teaching his peers. Um, they respect him for that. Um, but the others then also uh, gain from that experience. And it, the next problem that the team faces may be one that the ac next student is the expert in or knows at least more and becomes kind of the mini instructor. Um, so that's one aspect of the collaborative learning. They're, they're in it together. They need to solve the problem. Um, it's very active and engaged learning, which we know is good. But it also teaches them what they will see when they get into industry, which or into business or um, community service in some way, in that they won't know all of the answers when they start down a path or start trying to solve a problem. So the problem-based learning makes them realize, hey, hey, I don't know something, and then they have to go find out about it. And so this process of collaborative learning, whether it's from another student or whether it's from a teacher or whether it's from an internet resource, whatever it is, that whole process helps them develop their ability to learn, helps their um, confidence, and helps to some extent even relieve the load on the faculty member because now the faculty member is not the font of all knowledge, does not have to know everything, and can in fact work more as a coach with the students and help them develop their skills and abilities. So as we change the role of the faculty member and we do more of the collaborative learning, just a related question, uh, do you see any issues with industry? Do they have any concerns about our evaluation or assessment of individual students if they're working together? Well, I mean, uh, I mean this is what industry faces all the time. They're always evaluating their employees and their employees are typically always working with other employees. So industry is probably much more used to it than, than we educators are. So I don't think there's an issue there. Um, certainly many faculty struggle with, well, if it's all teamwork, mm -hmm. how do I worry about that individual who's just loafing and taking advantage of the other members of the team? And so there are techniques and tools that the faculty can use to um, essentially bring justice to the grading and so that the student who may be loafing, not doing their part, is in fact penalized for that in their grade. So there are tools and techniques that um, we can teach uh, or faculty can use to avoid that issue. There are some specific tools, um, for instance, peer evaluation. The peers themselves, the members of the team, rate each other. Um, and and it's, it can be a relatively wide-based rating. It can be not just kind of mechanics, logistics, did they do what they said they were going to do when they were supposed to? Did they show up for meetings? Did they you know, do those sorts of things? But also, what were they like as an individual to work with? Did they, uh, were they a good team member? Uh, those sorts of things. So I think it's, it's important for our faculty to realize that that's a common practice in industry. They're comfortable with that type of evaluation. And we will spend some more time later in this course talking about how we can assess and evaluate collaborative and team learning. I think one of the other things to keep in mind is that um, industry will value this sort of experience in the students. Um, they may even support it. Excellent. Um, at least here in the United States where we don't have some of the, the rules that may bind um, or prevent programs from being as entrepreneurial in Vietnam, at least for the moment, um, we have industry anxious to support student projects. Um, and they, they see this as a multitude of benefit to them, uh, to the industry, because they get to see how students perform, they, they know that there's a better educational product coming, but sometimes they even get a good solution out of it. Well, we're, we're in a very exciting time in Vietnam right now because those institutions um, actually have been given a lot more mm -hmm. autonomy. Mm -hmm. So we are seeing that open up. And so some of the things you mentioned, if there were constraints before, there's now some new opportunity. And it's just a matter, I think, of learning how to deal with that. And that's part of what we're right. here for. And again, there's a financial aspect of these transactions, which pre presents some additional complexities in Vietnam. Um, but I think awareness is up. 
and as you say, both on industry, um, and it can be small and large business. Uh, many of our projects here in Arizona State University actually come from small companies wanting to leverage their limited resources. Um, so it's, it's doable, uh, but it will take some work and some trial runs. And they may not always work, but I think the end result is very worth it. So what would be some final advice you would give a faculty member that wanted to start integrating some of these activities into their classroom? Well, I guess start slowly. In other words, try things incrementally, but start. Get going. Don't just think about it. Pick a day, a pick an assignment, pick an activity, and implement it in your course. Excellent. Thank you very much. We've heard a lot from Dr. Scott today about how to integrate active learning, some of the differences between project and problem-based learning and approaches you might take. So we thank you again for joining us and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Kathy.